this is such a shit going. All right. Let's get this going. Good afternoon, everyone. I see a lot of folks are joining and connecting to audio right now. Uh, I do apologize for any delay and for any issues that folks had getting into the room. Um, something about our Zoom registration link was acting a little strange today. So apologies for any issues that you've had there, but glad that you could make time to join us today. So if this is your first Ask the Expert session, welcome. We are very happy to have you. This is our second session of the year. And this is a opportunity for us to connect you all with some experts in the field who are doing some interesting and innovative things at that intersection of law enforcement and mental health. So as you all uh, may or may not be aware, my name is Ethan Aronson, despite what my uh, Zoom name says. And so um, I'm a senior policy analyst here at the CSG Justice Center, and um, I am leading this as the expert series. So we've got a couple others coming up for the year on a variety of topics. Uh, I'm going to put the link to the event page in the chat so that you can all uh, see and register for the next event. We're on for 90 minutes today, and we are very lucky to have uh, representatives from the Harris County Sheriff's Office and the uh, Harris County or Harris Center for Mental Health and IDD. So uh, what we are doing today is uh, sponsored in part by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. CSG uh, is a partner of BJAs, and they support us in doing the work that we do. Uh, we're a national nonpartisan nonprofit, and our goals are to break the cycle of incarceration, advance health opportunity and equity, as well as using data to improve safety and justice. So without further ado, um, I am going to ask folks if you are comfortable doing so and able, uh, we'd love to see some faces. If you're willing to go on camera, these sessions are set up to encourage discussion and question asking. Really, I don't want to be talking any more than I need to be. I want to let uh, Sergeant Gomez and Keisha Lorio speak about the wonderful program that they have down in Texas. So they're gonna start with a brief introduction of the core program that stands for Clinician Officer Remote Evaluation. And then we are gonna open it up for questions. Feel free to use the raise hand feature, take yourself off mute. You can put things in the chat. I'm more than happy to read the chat out, but uh, by all means, feel comfortable taking yourself off mute and contributing to the conversation. We really want this to be a good back and forth. Uh, and so at this point, uh, if you've got any questions, throw them in the chat, anything like uh, issues around getting into the Zoom, uh, shoot me an email or send me a chat. Uh, but at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Sergeant uh, Jose Gomez and let him tell you a little bit about CORE. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, hello, everybody. Just a real quick introduction. I've been with our agency uh, over 17 years now. Um, I've worked, you know, uh, our jail patrol in the last 13 years. I've been involved in crisis response, behavioral health training, things of that nature. In 2011, we formed our crisis intervention response team, and I was fortunate enough to start at the beginning of that program where it partners a, a therapist in the car and a mental health police officer. Uh, believe it or not, I had hair back then because I had a therapist in the car for seven years. Uh, I spent about, uh, again, seven years in that unit, a uh, great unit, got to do a lot of amazing things. It was very, very uh, awarding, uh, rewarding because of the people that we served. And because the way Harris County is, uh, we're about 1,800 square miles, over 5 million people, 
numerous jurisdictions within Harris County. The Harris County Sheriff's Office serves as the umbrella law enforcement agency or police agency in, in Harris County. So our co-responder teams uh, not only answered calls for service with, service with the mental health nexus within our own agency or areas that we patrolled at, but any other jurisdiction within Harris County that needed a crisis response team. It is a collaboration between the Harris Center, our, local, uh, our Houston Police Department and us, but because of the way we're set up in Harris County, we were answering calls for service from other agencies that needed assistance. And I can tell you from experience when in that unit, sometimes you're driving an hour to a location, okay? It's, it, it, Harris County is big. And in 2017, an individual by the name of uh, uh, Efren Fishkin, who uh, operated an agency called JSA Health, uh, brought the idea to us about utilizing technology out in the field uh, as a force multiplier to offer mental health assessments. It had never been done before as far as we knew. And he brought the idea to us and we started experimenting with it. Uh, myself and two other uh, crisis response team members uh, were given the tablet to see if this model would work. And it did. Uh, we found that it was very effective. And the response we got from the individuals that we were uh, doing these assessments on were very um, welcoming in trying to, you know, having that assessment done you know, just like they would do with a live person. Uh, we already had an existing collaboration with our local mental health authority, the Harris Center, uh, and it wasn't that uh, Dr. Dr. Fishkin's model uh, was, it, not that it was not good, but it was just because we already had an infrastructure with our local mental health authority, with our co-responder team, that we kind of transitioned with our local mental authority to establish this program, the Clinician and Officer Remote Evaluation Program. Uh, we piloted uh, with with the Harris Center, and we you know looked at all the legal issues, things of that nature. For example, in a lot of police agencies, a question we get asked: Do you have your body camera on while the assessment is done? And the answer is yes. So we figured all the little small kinks uh, within that pilot. We partnered up with an organization called Arnold Ventures, who uh, gave us funding for a whole year to conduct this pilot. It was twenty deputies, twenty tablets, and. The mission of this program or the pilot was not to create new crisis intervention teams. It was, this is a tool on your tool belt. You're a patrol officer or a patrol deputy patrolling. A call for service might come across your screen with the mental health nexus and you're asked to, to respond to it. During your the, the scene, it comes up that a, it might be beneficial to have a, a mental health assessment conducted. So it wasn't that there were new mental health units or anything like that, but this is, we wanted to see how this would work as a model of giving this as a tool to our police officers. In over a year, they answered approximately over 400 calls for service where the tablet was utilized. And over 50% of the calls for service where the tablet was utilized, they were able to resolve on scene that if it wasn't for the utilization of the tablet, they would have transported that individual. So that's huge, right? That you know, that was a huge data point that 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 came out of that pilot that told us that a lot of the times our police officers, you know, err on the side of caution or, or feel that they have enough to what we call here in Texas an emergency attention order uh, to get them to a psych hospital or, or get them to a hospital for a psych evaluation. If they could have enough to meet that criteria, they would take them. But because of the utilization of the tablet and the fact that they were able to uh, get that assessment done on scene it better triage that individual out there and offer it the resources they really, really needed instead of transporting them. So that was huge. Another data point that came out of that was that over 40% of these individuals, we were able to divert from the criminal justice system to the, to the mental health care system. So because of uh, our state law here on diversion, we were able to do that with the assistance of the tablet. So that was a huge accomplishment um, during that pilot to that our local government or the, what we call here commissioner's court funded the program for all the way to 2026 now. So the way that, that the county is set up, um, we started with just, you know, the pilot. We kind of evolved into um, having all our field training officers w uh, have the tablet. And some of you might ask yourself, why would you assign all your or at that time the tablets to your field training officers? Well, you're trying to shape the future of policing and you want to, how do you do that? Well, you do that with your field training officers, because as soon as your cadets or your or you, whatever you call them at your agency, they graduate, they should go through a field training program, whether it be three months, six months. So if you, inst you know, if you put that in there from part of the programming, then now you have your police officers when they graduate from that program, get used to utilizing that 
uh, that type of program. Um, and we've evolved now to where uh, we, the Harris County Sheriff's Office is the liaison agency for the core program in Harris County. And what that means, any police agency within Harris County that wishes to join the core program, um, we would kind of be play the liaison role. So if you imagine you have the local mental health authority, then us, and then all the police agencies that that join, there is a lot of day to day logistics that ha uh, that happen. Uh, we're blessed to have a full time police officer or deputy here that kind of manages the day to day. Right now, we're up to 16 police agencies and over 300 tablets. Uh, that means over 300 officers. Um, before we go talk to, uh, we, we go further into this, because uh, uh, Director Lori is on the line and she's going to talk a little bit about the, what it looks like on the clinician side. One of the examples I like to give uh, is something that happened during the pilot phase. Uh, again, it was 20 deputies. I get a phone call it's around Christmas and I've been, I'm in the attic trying to get Christmas down because my wife has ordered me to take all the Christmas stuff down. And I get a phone call. And it's a deputy, uh, Deputy Rodriguez. And she goes, Sarge, uh, I broke the iPad. I said, well, explain to me what happened. She goes, well, there was a call for service that came in. African-American male walking in the middle of the street, not making any sense, evening shift. Uh, another deputy picks it up. He gets there, starts talking to the individual, and he feels that he has enough that this individual fits the criteria to take him under emergency detention order. So... She hears that over the radio and she goes, hey, I'm nearby. Do you mind if I stop by so we can utilize the tablet? I haven't had a chance to use it. If this is a mental health related call, let's, let's try to use it. So she goes out there. They do an assessment. They connect the individual, just like we're talking here. It's via FaceTime. They're listening to the conversation. This individual was already connected to our local mental health authority, was already receiving some type of resource from our local mental health authority. And all he really needed was a refill on medication, some housing needs, and somebody to talk to. At the same time that that was going on, a call for service came in of a robbery in progress. Deputy Rodriguez puts a tablet on top of the Tahoe. They let the gentleman go, said, hey, here's the telephone number that, you know, uh, if you get a telephone number, but just stay in the general area because they had made the referral already to our local mental health authority to come talk to him at, at a later hour. And they drive off. What happened? The tablet stayed on top of the Tahoe and it went under. But guess what? They got to the call for service of the robbery in progress and they caught the bad guy and saved the victim. So a lot of things happened during this incident, right? We didn't take an unnecessary hospital bed, even though we had enough in the criteria according to the deputy to take them. So the deputy didn't have to transport. It put our police officers back in the community to patrol. We, we caught a bad guy and we saved the victim. All right. Now it cost uh, an iPad, but Holly, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, the iPad, we would have been all right. But all these things happen because of that assessment. So that's that's huge, right? So that's the way it would look logistically when a deputy arrives to a, to a scene is that they feel that, hey, we need a mental health assessment or there's some type of mental health question. You know, uh, we can just contact the individual via uh, uh, FaceTime. Ms. Keisha. We can't hear it. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Keisha Lohr with the Local Mental Health Authority. Okay, as far as the clinicians are concerned, I wanna actually back up to like before they even, even start. The clinicians, we have 12 clinicians. They are scattered 24 seven. Some of them start their shifts on Wednesday. Some of them start their shifts on Monday. Some of them start their shifts on Sunday. It just depends. Just make sure they work 24 seven. So we have 12 clinicians, they're all licensed either licensed professional counselors, licensed clinical social workers, LMFTs, and also they have crisis experience. One thing that's so important about this partnership, the, the clinicians are actually interviewed not only by the local mental health authority, but they're also interviewed by law enforcement. Because we want to make sure that the clinicians understand the partnership and how important a partnership is with the local mental health authority. So that's before they even start the program, they're actually, introduced to all the players, which is really important. Their main job is, yes, to do the assessment, but they actually do a lot more than that. Gomez was talking about the importance of information. They have a laptop at home. So they have the iPads where they can do the assessments on the laptops. And I'm gonna tell another story about how important it is to have information. Me and one of my officers were actually going to a call and 
the call dropped. And so he was like, okay, what's the person's history? And of course me, I'm just reading the history, not really paying attention, much attention to it because you know, the officer always focuses on safety. And I was reading the assessment and it, it said something to the fact that, hey, the last time this person was picked up needed to go to the hospital, they were suicidal. When they were in the car, they actually, in the back seat of the patrol car, they actually took the seat belt and wrapped it around their neck. So we're driving to the, to the scene of where we need to actually assess and maybe possibly transport this individual. And we get to the scene, we assess the person, decided yes, this person was actually in crisis, this person was suicidal, so this person needed hospitalization. Got the person in the car, driving back to the hospital, and all of a sudden, I was still talking to her the whole, whole time. It gets dark because, you know, I'm, if you guys know Houston, Harris County, it's massive. You have a long time before you get anywhere. So it starts to get dark, and all of a sudden, the person in the backseat gets quiet. So, of course, the, the law enforcement, who's always on alert, turns on the light. And, of course, what is she doing? She's in the backseat wrapping the, um, the seatbelt around her neck. We're actually driving on a highway. He, of course, pulls off on the side and then we literally have to jump out the car and literally unwrap her from the back seat. So actually that's important as far as how important the clinician's role is as far as just providing that information to the law enforcement. So along with the assessment, they do provide that information. They also provide, like the clinicians, they don't just do assessments. They also provide, if the if the, like I always tell the, the deputies and officers, if you have to chase this person down 10 miles, that's not really a core call. That's like something for cert. But they can still call and provide information where there's information, education, reserve hospital beds for the law enforcement individuals, and just still be that resource whether they actually do the assessment or not. They also link the person to services. If it wasn't for this collaboration, if our patients came in contact with law enforcement, we would not know that. But because of this, this collaboration with CORE, because we have so many iPads out there, now if the person come, becomes in contact with law enforcement and just by chance they're connected with the CORE program, we would actually know, hey, the person actually had a law enforcement collaboration if they're open at one of the clinics, we actually email a doctor, the caseworkers, the therapist, whoever's involved in this case, and let them know, hey, the person came in contact with law enforcement, could you follow up? So it's actually take, we out, we tell law enforcement doing trainings because we also train law enforcement before they even start the, the iPad program. Yes, people call 911 for literally everything. And they continue to do that, even though we do publicize 988 a lot now. You may actually be that first contact, but you know, after that, it's our responsibility to just follow up with them. So the clinician also links them to services and make sure they actually follow up with services. We have our um, mobile crisis outreach team that we link them to, so they can actually follow the, follow up with them. Whether it be it's supposed to be 30 days, but it pretty much they follow up with them as long as they actually need to be followed up with and actually get secured into services. The clinician also, um, if they're not taking law enforcement calls, they also help out with our crisis line. So they actually take some crisis line calls to actually make sure they stay busy and things of that nature. So the clinicians do a lot of different things that actually assist, the, assist with law enforcement in this, in this partnership. They have also phones. So their job is the minute that they get on shift, they email all the law enforcement officers that are out there in the community who are actually using the core program and let them know, hey, I'm on. And if by chance they have any connectivity issues while they're out in the field, they write down those addresses because we have a partnership of Verizon. Also a good relationship with our IT department. You cannot pretty much do this without a good relationship with your IT department and making sure you work with IT, they email addresses just in case if they have any connectivity issues. And if by chance they have to um, connect via phone, they can do that. So they still need a phone because just like technology, as I found out today, sometimes technology is just, you know, throw a loop in your day and it just makes things a little bit more difficult. But 
we work a lot to actually make sure this program runs as smoothly as it, as it possibly can. They also, when we never leave, like, like Gomez said, 50% of the calls are resolved on scene, but we never just leave a person quote unquote on scene. The next day the clinicians also follow up with that individual and just check in with them to make sure that even if they denied that they wanted linkage to services, even though they left them there, they call back the next day just to make contact, just to check and see how they're doing with either the caller or the patient or someone who was actually on that scene. So that's the clinician's role. I'm gonna turn it back over to Gomez, who I think is was gonna talk about maybe the evaluation. Yeah, so I, I'll touch a little bit on the event, but real quickly on, on different models, if you look at, if you're looking at implementing this in your city, uh, in your county, um, in your precinct, you know, what kind of model should you go with as far as who gets a tablet, things of that nature? We're pretty, it's pretty, uh, we've been pretty blessed to the collaborations we have with our police agencies. Again, these are 16 different police agencies now. The way our police department or the sheriff's office is set up is we have what we call a car share program. So our deputies might not go directly to the station and might see the station maybe once or twice a week, depending on when roll call and things of that nature. So the model we have at, at the sheriff's office is that the deputies are uh, issued the tablet directly to them. They have them. We have 85 uh, field training officers. Then we have a few others across uh, all three shifts that are assigned the tablet so they have it at all times. So we have a little bit more of the tablets at the sheriff's office because of the way our police agency is set up. The Houston Police Department, because they have daily roll calls and they have to pick up their patrol car at an actual station, the sergeants there are ordered to issue the tablets at every shift. So the, the police officer gets there at the beginning of the shift, he's issued a tablet, at the end of the shift he has to turn it in, and as you get it, every shift is just like that. Okay, across all three different shifts, across all their uh, other police stations. There is another program that we uh, we wanted to start at one point here. We named it CERT Light, uh, L I T E. <laughs> um, and what it is, instead of having a full time clinician in the car, like our co responder teams are, it would be a full time CIT police officer with a tablet that all they do is answer calls for ser service with the mental health nexus. There are police uh, uh, agencies within Harris County that have dedicated one deputy or one police officer, and that's what they do, and, and it, we call it CERT Light. Uh, that is a different model. Uh, again, the other model that we also have here is all our field training officers, which a lot of agencies uh, have, has, uh, have uh, established as well, is giving their field training officers a tablet so they can train their new recruits as they're training up. Out there now, as far as evaluation, you know, I mentioned those uh, percentages earlier. But the way we collected the the data during the pilot is that every time it pull, one of our deputies utilized the tablet, an automatic uh, uh, survey would pop up, and so they would have to click, click through the survey. Now, remember, it's a small group, so we, you know, they were individually selected. We trusted them to do, to be honest. So some of the percentages I'm going to give you here is about how the, the deputy felt about the program. So. One of the questions we asked is, would you have called our co-responder team if it wasn't for the iPad? And over 88% stated they would have called sir. They would have waited there for us to get there if it wasn't for uh, the tablet. A similar question uh, that was asked is, did the clinician help you decide what course of action to take with the consumer? And over 93% of them said yes every single time. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the police officer felt a lot more comfortable making a decision with the backup of the clinician or the assessment of the clinician. And I can tell you from being in the co-responder team, uh, actually uh, Director Lorio and I were partners 10 years ago. Um, now she's the director over core and CERT and I oversee our behavioral training and projects. Um, that a lot of the times we're driving to a scene and the deputy needed in-person advice. That really is what they needed. They could have figured that out, whether it be on a phone call or, you know, or the now the, the core program. So what that's told us is that this program is very effective in making a better decision out there in the field, not just for the police officer, but for the for the individual that we're serving, for the community members that we're serving. We're making better decisions because of the triage, the type of triage that we're doing out there. Um, 
one of the other questions was, do you believe that the clinician helped you handle the call in a shorter period of time if, it was, if, if you responded without the clinician? And that goes back to sometimes when you arrive on the scene, you know, people don't want to talk to us. When you offer that option of talking to somebody else other than a police officer, they tend to sometimes be a little bit more honest. Um, and it's just a way you, how you advertise what the clinician and officer mode evaluation program is. So uh, over over 88% said that, yeah, they actually with a tablet, it helped us, you know, kind of handle this at a shorter period of time instead of going back and forth with the individual. Now, the average time between when the deputy got there, an assessment was done and a decision was made and leaving the scene was about 21 minutes. So you, you might ask yourself, well, that's a very, that's very quick. Well, you know, when you, the police officer gets there, assesses and tries to, you know, push, you know, kind of talk about the program, the assessment's going to be eight to 10 minutes, uh, depending. Are there times that it goes more than that? Absolutely. But the average time was 20 minutes. Uh, 21 minutes. Uh, so a lot of deputies were very happy with the fact that they were able to provide this type of resource out there in the field. Now, another one that we ask is that if it wasn't for the iPad, did you feel that you would have transported this individual? And almost 80% said yes, that if it wasn't for the organization of the iPad, they would have transported the individual because they believed they had enough to take them to a, a nearby hospital. But because of the utilization of the iPad, they were better, uh, they were able to better triage this individual and get them resources, something that we call here total diversion. We weren't had we didn't have to transport anybody. We were able to provide those resources there and we were able to connect them to those resources through a local mental authority. Now, another very interesting data point that we we got out of this is, uh, and that happened on the local mental health authority side at the Harris Center, was that almost 50% of the people that we made contact during the pilot were first time users to any mental health resource. That means that before the police were involved, they had never ever seek mental health resources or never even gone to any type of mental health resource. So that was huge. That means we were able to connect them. Now we don't have the actual data point, but just based on that, we looked at uh, our calls for service and we found that we were going less and less to some of these repeat callers because we were able to connect them to that local mental, to our local mental authority. So that was huge. Um, for training on the police officer side, we offer, you know, we have to make, uh, there, there is a bill that came out in 2017 called the Sandra Bland Act. It did require that all Texas peace officers or all Texas police officers take a 40 hour crisis intervention training but here in Harris, the Harris County Sheriff's Office, we give them the 40-hour uh, crisis intervention training and also a class that was developed by the Police Executive Research Forum called Integrating Communications Assessments and Tactics, ICAT, which is an, a 16-hour de-escalation class. Uh, and then we give them uh, what we call, uh, or Georgetown Law calls, Active Bystandership for Law Enforcement. And then we also have a yearly CIT update class. So there's a lot of training uh, when it comes to uh, behavioral health response uh, at the sheriff's office. So we give all that before, you know, they go out to 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 start patrolling. Ms. Keisha, you want to talk about the training on the clinician side? Okay. The clinicians, they, when, they, when they're first hired, of course, they go through what's called like the employee training, learning how to do their job, basically whether it be learning our medical record system, whether it be just learning about the different programs and agency. There's a lot of different programs and agency, no matter how long you've been here, there's always something to learn. But once they actually get on the so-called so -called unit, they have, we actually train quarterly with law enforcement. At one time, we actually used to go to the academy and train with them, but now we actually have a different spot where we actually go and just train and learn about just different things, whether it be mental health diagnosis, whether it be ACEs, whether it be some type of legal things that come up, for instance, like, like different kind of telehealth laws. Like we had clinicians that wanted to actually work, um, in t work take telehealth calls in Texas, but maybe can they, they say, can we live out of state? And of course the answer is like, you know, no, because whether it be licensure laws or telehealth laws, they pretty much just have to be trained in all those different kinds of things, whether it be mental health law and just different things that are going on, even from the law enforcement's perspective and Senate bills and things like that. So, I mean, those trainings are pretty much ongoing. It's, 
we pretty much have to keep up with different kinds of things. And as soon as we find out something, then we let them know different things that are just going on within telehealth. So that's just another extra thing that you would definitely have to keep up with. We also have a good relationship with our legal department, just in case if you don't know something, you can always refer to legal to make sure, you, as far as even like HIPAA and making sure, because we have people say, like actually it was the law enforcement, why can't we just use FaceTime? It's just so easy. Everybody has FaceTime on their phone. And I can't, if I had a quarter for every time a, a law enforcement told me that. Um, but just learning different things and what's legal and what's not legal. That's the kind of trainings that they do, whether it be whether clinician side or law enforcement side to make, just make sure that we stay compliant with every everything that even the, the new substance abuse law that just came out as far as what they can divulge, making sure that they stay compliant with the agency laws, the, the state laws, whether it be in law enforcement as far as even training them on emergency detention orders so they can actually train the officers on how to complete emergency detention orders so they're not, you know, turned away once they get into the hospital. And the clinicians also take a lot of other trainings, whether it be from the agency or just other trainings that they're just interested in. If I see trainings, I'll just send it to them. So they're constantly trained on different things and, of course, keeping up with their licensure and things like that. One thing I actually want to go back on is as far as training, though, not only do they stay trained, they also train the law enforcement and they train together. I think that just recently they went to some roll calls to even train law enforcement. So they're part of they're part of that process, too, as far as being out there training the 1850 classes or the 4100 classes that's involved with law enforcement. Just we have individuals who are trained in hostage negotiation skills with law enforcement. So this is one position where they're exposed to so many things, whether it be mental health or law enforcement. Uh, so, so Keisha and Rico, we have some questions in the chat. Uh, I'd love to get us started on the Q&A portion. Uh, Rico, I know you're about to jump into something. If you're okay, pausing for a second. Uh, I just wanted to go to Edmund's question here because it relates to some of the training and you know what Keisha was just talking about as far as like the legality of what kind of program you can use to do telehealth. So Edmund, if you want to come off mute and ask the question yourself, you're more than welcome. Otherwise, I will read it out to our presenters. Uh, so the question is, are there national standards for telejudicial communication protocols between civil commitment courts, jurisdictions for private hospitals, public venues, including probate courts and the magistrates? So. Lots of things bundled into that question, but what I think the heart of it is, is when you were starting up the core program, what did you learn about the national standards and the legality around telecommunication protocols for law enforcement and behavioral health agencies? So at the time, this is pre-COVID, so there wasn't, you know... Um... A lot of stuff to research because as far as we knew it at the time this is 2017 18 uh, when we first started the pilot with dr fishkin uh there really wasn't much for uh, uh kind of like standards or protocols uh, at that time what i can tell you that you know we kind of got with our legal department and they kind of gave us a green light to start it uh, didn't find any issues at that time and still to this day, even after COVID, have any anything like that. The only thing I will say is, you know, I did bring up, uh, I was one of the ones that brought up, uh, how come we can't do FaceTime? And they said, well, it's not secure. I said, well, that's the last time I FaceTimed my wife. But, uh, you know, that was one of the things that, uh, the biggest thing that we said was what platform can we do that? And as long as it was HIPAA compliant, there was no issues there. Uh, and the Harris Center was already using life size at the time. So it was a no-brainer to continue with that because as long as it was HIPAA uh, protected, then we were we were given the green light. Ms. Keisha? Now, on our end, is, it, it, we talked a lot about consent to treatment, to be perfectly honest. We like with, we have another um, partner program, CERT, where you know, if the person's in crisis, 
you don't have to pretty much worry about consent of treatment. Well, CORE is a little bit different. These are individuals who do consent to treatment who actually can consent to saying, yes, I want an assessment via telehealth. So we do have the consent to treatment. And another thing that they were also focused on is making sure that people who actually were employed with CORE and licensed in the state of Texas were actually here because it was like, oh, you know, it's, it's international. We can pretty much move to like Canada and do online treatment. And uh, it, it doesn't really work that way. And, you know, it's, especially when you're dealing with licensure boards and, and taxes and things like that. But, you know, we had a lot of people who pretty much just wanted to apply from everywhere. So we just had to make sure that we were actually doing the right thing, whether it be in, in the state of Texas, also where they wanted to actually be located physically, where the patient was located physically, and making sure that we were actually doing everything correctly from that end too. So that was the things that we were focused on. Now on the consent part, uh, you heard Ms. Keisha talk about the consent. As far as on the, on the police side, we don't really worry about the consent. Uh, the way we kind of uh, sell this to the individual that we want to have the mental health assessment done, we would say something to the effect, uh, hey, we have somebody for you to talk to. It is a clinician. Well, what, and they'll ask, well, what is a clinician? It's kind of like a therapist. You'll, you probably already can think about the response. Like, well, I'm not, you know, crazy or something like that. And I said, hey, this is just another resource. I don't have access to some of the things that you. I think you would benefit from. How about you just, you know, we're going to go ahead and call them. You talk to them. If you feel like you don't, then that's, you know, something you'll figure out with the individual you're going to talk to. So we kind of connect them, we give them. And then as that introduction, the clinicians 99.99% of the time do very well in getting them that connected. So we really don't worry about yes or no. We, we're more about selling that this is happening and just talk to them. And then if, you know, have there been situations where the, the individual says, I'm not talking to you? Yes. But majority of the time, once that police officer makes that connection with the individual, the clinician does a phenomenal job in getting them connected. Thanks so much for that. Edmund, uh, is there any follow-up or does anybody else have follow-up or questions on the national standards, the telecommunications rules? Anybody have a question there or shall we move forward? Ethan, Ernie put a, a question down there uh, to follow up with that question. Do clinicians need CGIS training? Uh, not for the core program. It, for the CERT program, it's different. But for the core program, uh, it would be no. Because they're not in our cars. They're not seeing our screen like a like a co-responder would. They're, yeah, they're remote at their home. So the most important thing is, is making sure that you're somewhere where you're by yourself in your home and you don't have anybody like over your computer, like looking at your stuff or... Uh, you know, hearing assessment, things like that. So, no, we don't do the procedures with them. Thanks. And I see in the chat a question from Elizabeth P. Uh, Elizabeth, do you want to ask it yourself? I'll give you a second to come off mute if you would prefer. Sure. Um, thank you all so much. It's incredibly exciting work, and we're doing a lot of the same work here in Boston, um, both with the Boston Police Department, but also with Boston EMS. So definitely one of our challenges has been currently we provide seven day a week coverage, but we do not provide 24 hour coverage. And the reason that we've been hesitant to expand our hours into the overnight shift is that our diversionary options are really limited. So other than sort of what we consider treating in place or leaving the individual on scene, it's either it's determined they're safe to stay on scene or we have to transport them to an emergency department because all of the other options we would use during daytime hours are closed. So I was just curious to know kind of specific to your overnights and the use of telehealth, do you find that individuals are left on scene or that it's still resulting in emergency departments? Do you guys have other options besides those two that maybe we need to be considering? It, depend, oh, it depends on what the call is about, to be perfectly honest. We did have some trouble, for instance, who for individuals who were just homeless and they just wanted to get off the street. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a homeless outreach team program that provide IDs to individuals. So in those cases, we can refer to the homeless outreach team that we have that can go find them maybe the next day and offer IDs and services for those individuals. 
but overnight, I mean, the process will still be the same. I mean, because to be honest, Houston has a lot, a lot of resources. And we hear all the time, hey, go to Houston, they have a lot of resources for you. <laughs> but we do have places, for instance, like if they're, if it's a PI, they can go to the Sobern Center. If they're in crisis, they can go to our neuropsychiatric center, which is also 24 seven. If we have a, the MCOT program that's, that works 24 seven, so they can come out there and link them to services. It, but it really depends on what they're calling for. If they're calling because they're not in a mental health crisis or they're not in crisis at all, they don't want to get the services, they just pretty much want a, a roof over their head, which is totally understandable. We do have the homeless outreach team, but that could still be a day. It just depends. So that the, our homeless outreach team, we do have uh, five teams, 10 deputies uh, spread out through uh, all districts, five districts, but it's during day shift. But we do have the diversion program that it, uh, if we respond to an individual who's committed a low-level nonviolent misdemeanor and there's a mental health nexus attached to that, we can transport them to our diversion center. The diversion center is open 24 seven, uh, but it's open to the whole county. So there's a lot of, you know, not just the Harris County Sheriff's Office, but if the tablet or the core program is utilized during that situation, the clinician in the core program would call the diversion center and set up a bed also, they would set up a bed for if that individual is in a crisis. So the way the state law in Texas is written is that we can transport to any hospital that has an attached ER. So our neuropsychiatric center, where we primarily would like to transport, is not that big. It might have 40-something beds, because uh, I know that we're expanding. But we, we in Texas are allowed to transport to any hospital as long as there's an ER attached to it. Uh, so we do utilize that a lot overnight. Um, because there, you know, a lot of places are full or the resources are not available. Wow. That's really incredible. I mean, we are lucky enough to have, you know, urgent care, behavioral health, urgent care centers that we can bring folks to instead of going to the emergency department, if we don't feel like they meet the criteria for that emergency hold. Um, but unfortunately it closes at 11 PM. And so from 11 PM to 8 AM, we're really, really limited into what we can offer an individual other than the emergency department, which sort of, you know, isn't the purpose of the program, right? So um, looks like we need to come to Houston. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if anybody is interested in learning more about Harris County um, or Houston, both of them are, are law enforcement mental health learning sites. I'm dropping a link in the chat right now to the learning site webpage. Uh, these folks, not only are they great presenters and giving us their time to talk about CORE today, as a learning site, they do host a lot of site visits. So if you're interested in seeing some of this in person, um, you know, you can reach out directly. You can reach out through me and learn a little bit more on the webpage and a couple of the other pages that have been linked in the chat. Um, the I, we got a question uh, from Bach in California. I don't know if we're going to be able to answer this one specific to California, Bach. So I'm going to ask it with regards to Texas, if that's okay. So Rico, if if a client meets the criteria for an EDO, an emergency detention, they are a danger to self, danger to others, or gravely disabled. Would how would core interact with that? person is this a situation where you would even use core or would the officer if a person is this kind of danger to themselves would you be sending cert out would core maybe arrive on scene and then call in cert how walk us through the process so it could be either or so a, dep a deputy without the, an ipad would get there with, uh, and assess the situation and say hey i probably need core or cert either or or hey, search too far. Let me get a core deputy here. Um, the core deputy would get there, uh, even if they believe already that they have enough. If the police officer or the deputy knows, hey, I have enough for what you call their a uh, five one five zero hold. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take them. We, you know, we're on the on the thought like, hey, let's just do the assessment anyways, because you know, if we have just that one more layer, it not not only help the individual that we're helping, but it also helped the police officer. For example. When we start, first started this, we had, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if this happened in other states, but sometimes when we transport for what you call a 5150, 
let's say we go to the hospital and you turn in your 5150, you might go to the restroom, get yourself a snack at the hospital, they offer one. And as you're walking out, the person you just admitted is walking out with you because yes. And I see somebody saying, Bach, saying, yes, that's very true. Yes. So they walk out with you. Well, we've had that happen. And the, as soon as they walked out, they went, they went and did an internal affairs complaint. Well, internal affairs doesn't, you know, they know about the problems, things like that, but I mean, they're not subject matter experts in this. So I get the phone call and say, how did this deputy, you know, this, this person is claiming that they've been, you know, their rights have been violated and, and the doctor even agreed and let them go out 30 minutes after. Well, hold on. The way it works is that they're a danger to self at this time. At this time, we believe that. But now, given the fact that the clinician agreed that with the deputy, that was even an extra protection level layer or layer of protection for the deputy to say, hey, it wasn't just me. It was a mental health professional. We both concluded together this individual needed to be assessed, uh, needed more of an assessment in, in, a, in a hospital setting, in a psychiatric setting. Uh, it wasn't just a police officer. So even if they knew or they believe that they have enough, just having that assessment helps out. And again, with our core program, the clinician will help facilitate a a bed. So if they figure out that there's a bed around, you know, where the deputy's at, they're able to call the hospital and say, hey, you have an incoming uh, uh, your way. Uh, and that's just about it, right? They don't do the paperwork because we're the only ones going to do the paperwork. But we've had that happen. So it's just an, uh, even if you do believe uh, that individual, we said we our direction is, you know, if, if the individual you're able to do an assessment, go ahead and do the assessment, introduce the iPad, because there might be some other resources that you're not, you know, that they might need that you're not even offering or might have thought. We go back to like when we talk about in training, there's a lot of information us as police officers are required to process a lot. And just having that extra person there to say, hey, this is what I have. And they hear you out and say, hey, have you thought about this? Just having that, it, it was very beneficial to our, our police officers and our deputies and the program was very welcoming. Once they figured out, hey, I could, this really is an advantage to me. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Bob, I mean, add, any yeah. follow-up there? Okay, I want to add something to that too. I mean, I've had a lot of hospitals that call me and say, hey, you guys are going to put, you know, well, first of all, they think every call every call involved mental health is like has, has to do with like either cert or core. So they'll say, oh, we're, you're literally going to put us out of business. Don't bring people here anymore. I mean, I've literally had like CEOs of hospitals call me and, and like literally say that. But one thing about the, um, the core program, yes, you may feel that this person needs to go to the hospital. But if you can have someone assess and say, hey, this person can stay at home and we will follow up in the morning. We will call tomorrow. I mean, that's actually pretty much a better deal for the patient and for the, for the officers, that way they won't have to transport. Because I've actually ha had to work with patients as far as like dealing with case management where they actually go to some of these private hospitals and then they get a $5,000 bill. Of course, then they can't really pay that, but then you, you have another issue where you're working with um, this person to, to actually say now they're stressed out because they got this really huge bill and you have to figure out what you're gonna do about that. So now you're calling the hospital trying to see, hey, if there is a payment plan, hey, this person's homeless, you know, they have a mental health diagnosis and now they have, they're have they walking around with a $5,000 bill and they're really stressed out. So actually programs like this can, you know, actually help in preventing a lot of that. That is excellent. Uh, Bach, did that clear anything up for you? Is there any uh, remaining questions? No additional, thank you. Appreciate the response. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so our next question in the chat is from M. Uh, M, do you want to come off mute and ask yourself? I'll give you a second if you would be comfortable doing so. Or sure. I'll yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for pulling this together. My question really had to do with what data you might have at this point I'm in a couple different realms. So my first question was, you know, do you have any data again at this point uh, to reflect deflection that's happening from your justice system, such as treatment instead of arrest? And also if there's any data again, as of yet, showing any changes in arrest rates for mental health related calls. So when calls are coded as mental health related, are you starting to see any changes, you know, in those outcomes? based off of this work so you asked a, a very uh i think complex question because it 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 i can answer there's different answers to your question because one do we have data for the core program 
we collect individuals that we divert from the criminal justice system to the mental health care system, yes. And what kind of diversions were there? Were there criminal trespass, uh, uh, possession, uh, you know, anything other than a felony uh, or nonviolent? We do have that data. But when you said at the end, uh, calls that are coded mental health, we have a different system than other police agencies. And well, you'll see a lot of police agencies have different systems. Some of them don't even collect mental health data. And, and the reason is for that is at which point do you code a call mental health? So at at the Houston Police Department, for example, if you were to call 911 uh, and they answer and you say something to the effect, I am worried about my mother. She has dementia. I haven't talked to her in a while. They would say welfare check slash CIT. So they would collect it at the beginning of the call. And that would go to the bank of CIT related calls at the Harris County Sheriff's Office. Sorry. Sorry. I don't know if y'all heard that, but I heard it on my end. So at the Harris County Sheriff's Office, it's up to the deputy. Once they make the scene, let's say for the same call, but it'll say on our call slip that it's mental health related, but it doesn't collect it on, on a data point. Where it's collected is once the police officer or the deputy gets there and figures out, hey, you know what, this is a mental health related call. I'm going to clear it, uh, whatever it is, report, and I'm going to click a button that says CIT related. That'll collect it. But let's say, for example, on the HPD model, officer gets there, come to find out mom does not have dementia. It's a family issue. They just don't talk. That's still coded CIT. That's going to be left at CIT if the officer doesn't corrected on our end since it wasn't broke it didn't come in as a cit related call the officer gets there figures out hey this is not a cit related call like you know same scenario and they just cleared report so it just depends on on the system that we uh, that you know a police agency will utilize we do collect the mental health related calls uh as a uh, for the agency but for core and cert or corresponder model we collect how many calls for service we went that were directly mental health related, how many of those were diver diversions, how many of those were we able to resolve on scene that if it wasn't for the unit, they, it, they would have been transported. Right. Uh, and there's one more, I believe, a result of the jail diversion and arrest and emergency detention orders. You want to add something to that, Ms. Keisha? Um, in addition to that kind of data that, that um, well, we collect the same thing, but just, of course, for the, the CERT and the core program, we also collect, if it's like, of course, like the first encounter, because one thing about the local mental health authority, yes, we have 82 locations, but a lot of locations are in within the city of Houston. If it wasn't for the collaboration with, with the Harris County Sheriff's Office, we may not actually know about people that need services in the outline area. So we collect the first encounter data also. We also collect if they were medication compliant. The reason why that's so important, you might have a patient that's becoming a crisis off their medication because one, they might say, hey, either I didn't like the medication and I just didn't want to take it, or they may be having side effects to the medication. The side effects we may actually can do something about. So that's really important. Because also we can work with the doctor, hey, they're not, it's not that they don't want to take the medication to be stable, but they're actually having problems with the medication. And so maybe they just need a medication adjustment. So they get that type of data along with the referrals, all the, the agencies that we actually use. I know for a fact with the CERT program, they, out of all the calls that they take, only like 1% a year actually go to jail. And, and to be perfectly honest, that's because they probably already have a warrant out already because the, the Point of the programs are not to put people in jail, but if they have a warrant already, that's just something that we can't do anything about. And we also collect, um, of course, whether they were open to the Harris Center at the time of the contact. That's that's important for the local mental health authorities too, along with the disposition and what happens with the patient after that. Okay. Am any follow up there, or did that address your your data questions? No, it it does, and I I appreciate you know that acknowledgement that everyone's systems are a little bit different, um, and I think it just shows how elusive sometimes data can be that we really want. Um, so no, I really appreciate it because I was interested in just kind of that interplay between you know 
bringing on and implementing this particular initiative and starting to see, you know, some of those quantitative results, which it sounds like you definitely are seeing and absolutely on the qualitative side with the conversations with your officers and your staff. And it's, it's wonderful to hear about. Thank you so much. And if I could follow up with that, thank you, Em, for asking that. Uh, part of your question, the way we were able to grow or expand as much as we did was because of the evaluation that was done in 2019 with the partnership with Arnold Ventures and the University of Houston. So we collected that all that data, including at the time, and trust me, it was really hard because we didn't have the system set up to see how many call, mental health related calls for service we had as a total. So myself and, and one of the other individuals I was working with, we had to dig through all that and turn that into University of Houston along with our core data in the Harris Center and come up with this whole report. And I put the link in there about the implementation guide. There's a lot of information in there about it. Um, and once we were able to get that report, our local government uh, commissioner's court, they saw it and the recommendation for University of Houston is said, hey, this is a great idea that needs to be implemented. And that was what really pushed our local government to say, this is needed across Harris County at police agencies. And we're trying to make an impact on how many people we can divert from our, our jail. Uh, Rico, I'm having a moment where I, I cannot recall something about your work with Arnold Ventures. Did Arnold approach Harris County Sheriff's Office or did HCSO reach out to Arnold? How did you get in touch with them to start this evaluation collaboration? At that time, it was, uh, uh, I believe, uh, Frank Webb uh, and oh. Chief Lee, the sheriff, the University of Houston. We had a, uh, Wayne Young. We had a lot of support uh, from our leadership. Uh, to get this going. So uh, I do want to give credit to them. I, I believe that's how the contact was made in the recommendation. And we also have a really great grants department and that helped facilitate all that. So it was uh, it was a really big collaborative effort between all, uh, all of us. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for, for going into that because I know that a lot of people are probably interested in, well, that sounds great. How could I get that? And it sounds like some of it is you know, hitting the pavement hard, getting some buy-in from upper levels of leadership, and then leveraging that into reaching out to some people who could provide expert assistance, much in the way that Arnold did for you. All right, Edmund, uh, another question from Edmund here. Uh, do you want to ask yourself or shall I read? I'll can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I'm uh, Edmund Creekmore. I'm a forensic clinical psychologist. And uh, in Virginia, we're um, looking at different diversion proposals. And I was just curious as to whether in Harris County, there is some pre-booking diversion for those minor misdemeanors uh, you alluded to or, uh, or the officer alluded to earlier, uh, or is it all done post-booking and pre-trial? So uh, there, there are several uh, versions of this. One, we can do it, you know, uh, at, at the phone call if a deputy gets there and it's a low level nonviolent misdemeanor with a mental health nexus, even if, of course, not uh, an option or not available, uh, the deputy would call. The way we're set up in Harris County is that anytime we want to uh, charge, we we have to call our district attorney's office. So the deputy would give the district attorney office a rundown of what's going on. And the district attorney's office can say, hey, you need to go ahead and divert. Or the deputy says, I believe, or the police officer, I, do, I believe I do have enough to divert and we just go directly to the diversion center. Then we have the core program that will help facilitate that if an assessment is done. They can go ahead and, and, and assist with the diversion along with our core responder team. Now, we do have a uh, an, another gate, you would say, any agency that transport to our joint processing center uh, at which is a kind of collaborative effort between the Houston Police Department and the Sheriff's Office, but everybody in Harris County, that's where they transport uh, uh, their suspects, if that's what you want to call them. When they get there, if there's some type of mental health nexus uh, attached to it, is it, and it's a low-level nonviolent misdemeanor, the law is very specific, it has to be a low-level nonviolent misdemeanor, and there's some type of mental health-related issue, whether the individual identifies as being depressed bipolar, schizoaffective, whatever have you, they there's actually what we call a diversion desk there where they'll be greeted by a clinician and either an assistant district attorney 
or some type of other related uh, individual to the district attorney's office to facilitate whether this individual still needs to be charged or uh, diverted at that point. So there's def there's different points where an individual could get diverted. Just uh, can I ask one follow-up question on that? Um, do, do they require to be diverted, uh, if we're talking about serious mental illness, a civil commitment order to be uh, uh, sent to, let us say, the hospital or some other crisis center in Harris County? So if the individual has been diverted and they're in crisis, then it's what we call here an emergency detention order. The individual will be transported directly to the psych facility or a hospital. If they're, they're not in crisis, but there is a mental health nexus or the individual has some type of mental health diagnosis, they do not need any type, any type of that uh, paperwork. It, it, the district attorney's the district attorney's office will refuse the charge or decline the charge when they get transported to the diversion center because it is a voluntary program. Once we get there, they can just walk out. And, and what about if they don't have the capacity to consent or they don't seem to be? Does you have a qualified mental health professional to make that determination uh, at at your? Uh, uh, crisis center where you send most of these uh, patients for assessment? Yes, the diversion center is operated by our local mental health authority and not the police department. So there are the mental health professionals there and our local mental authority is embedded within our jail as well. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Okay. So, I received a question or two in the chat directly, but I am going to pause a moment and see if anyone wants to come off mute and ask a question. Okay, uh, so uh, I got a I got a question directly uh, for our two presenters. Um, <clears throat> So by all accounts, it seems that your program is spectacular. And in the interest of full transparency and learning from the experts, what would you say is the main issue that you run into when operating CORE? Are there any issues with your telehealth programming that you've run into, either that you've solved or that are ongoing and you're looking to find workthroughs for? So I would say, Especially if you're beginning to, uh, if you're at the beginning stages of implementing this, you know, uh, I, I make this uh, statement, you know, and, and the cops on the line might get it is that there's two things about cops. Uh, we want change, but when we change happens, we don't like it. Right. So this is a new program. If you're implementing this and you got to be available 24 seven on both sides, whether it be on the police side or the uh, the Harris Center side. I give this example one night. Uh, I'm sure everybody's seen the commercial from Jake at State Farm in the middle of the night. What are you doing? I'm talking to Jake. Um, I kind of found myself in the same situation. It was the middle of the night, two, three in the morning. I had a field training officer saying, hey, I cannot get this iPad to work. I wanted to get an assessment. If you can't connect me, I, I just want to know. And I'm like, well, it's two, three in the morning. But I had my phone, my my county issued phone. And it, uh, at the, we're at the very beginning stage of this. So you have to be available because if you're not available for those individuals, they're not going to use utilize the product, and you got to figure out all the kinks at the very beginning. So what I did, I got on, um, I rolled out of bed, went into the closet, and I I utilized the app on my phone, and I and I called the clinician, and I said, hey, I have a deputy that needs you. I'm going to go ahead and connect you. And after that, that deputy continued to utilize it. I, I really do believe that if I wasn't available at two, three in the morning for the individual, they probably wouldn't have used it anymore because they would have said, hey, oh, this thing doesn't work. So that would be one of the things that I would really suggest is to you at least the very beginning have somebody that's available twenty four seven both on the police side and the local mental health side because uh, you know he's not here but there's an individual by the name of Daniel from their IT who was always available along with Miss Keisha I don't think we slept for the first year of this program trying to make sure it was implemented so uh, that would be one of the things that I would say is be available for your people at the beginning stages to make sure you've worked everything out. Okay, one thing I want to add, well, two things I want to add to that is also, I'm pretty sure you guys remember when Texas, the whole state of Texas lost power. And of course, this program, I mean, it's telehealth and you need, you need power. And the state of Texas had none. 
one thing I, I mean, your staff, I mean, they really have to be motivated. I mean, we had staff members like literally going to hospitals, borrowing their power. We had to get solar chargers. I mean, just being creative just to make sure that we could stay up and running. And they actually were able to stay up and running still 24 seven when literally the, there was no power in, in the whole state. It was just, and who can expect that? I mean, that was, it was just amazing. The just the insight that the commissions had to just make it work, whether it be charging their phones in their cars. So that was something that we definitely worked through. So just remember, I mean, make sure you, you're you located somewhere where you definitely have a generator power, just something that you can use to actually, because law enforcement, they were still all taking calls. So we still had to be there with, with pretty much with no resources and didn't skip a beat. Another thing to be perfectly honest, especially when first starting this, this program and we went to like whether the cadet classes or the 1850 classes, which is, which is the mental health classes, the train law enforcement, you know, you hear a lot, hey, we're not therapists, we're not social workers, we don't want to be, that's not something that we want to be. So it's also making sure that you sell the program correctly, that yes, you still may be that first contact, but we're here hopefully to take over. And that way they won't have to call the police. They can call the local mental health authority. And we're, we're here to help you guys and be a resource because they're going to call anyway. So that was just another, I guess, hurdle with them actually wanting at first to maybe even use the program. And then, you know, once they, we know we start them off even at cadet classes. So once they start using it, you know, talking to the therapist at the cadet classes, learning from the therapist who's actually taking the calls, the kind of services that they can offer them and letting them play with the iPads. We have the partnership with Apple, letting them play with the iPads and, you know, showing them how to use life size step-by-step, -step, giving them the passwords and things like that. So they can actually be introduced to the, those programs even before they actually get the patrol. And, you know, that's pretty much has helped, you know, when they say, you know, we're not therapists and maybe we don't want to use it, then you realize, hey, they are using it. And then, you know, once they actually learn how to do the assessment, then of course, then they, you know, they, they want to do the assessments. And then, so that's, that's nice. Um, but because if they can actually know what to ask and actually know all the resources and work with the therapist, I mean, at the end of the day, you're, you're serving the public and the, and the patients that you come in contact with. And that's the important thing. I added a link. Sorry, these I added a link on there because we partnered up with Verizon at the very beginning because you know we we have uh, areas that we didn't get much signal. So anything that we had, any issues we had, we actually had a representative from Verizon Wireless to help facilitate that in case you know because I mean we have a road in the middle of nowhere called Kickapoo. So you know when we're out there, the signal is is no good. So having that relationship at the very beginning, trying to figure everything out, uh, I would say is essential. Absolutely. And Keisha, you mentioned something that that made my ears perk up a little bit just about training and, and hours of operation. Um, thinking about the clinicians who are on the other side of these calls. So you're operating 24 seven is my understanding. I work with grantees around the country who would love to go 24 seven, but have a real hard time recruiting uh, mental health clinicians to work overnight hours. Could you talk a little bit about how you were able to kind of sell that position? Did you need to give people bonuses? Um, was it just that, hey, working from home is a nice benefit? How did you get folks to sign up for that, um, those shifts in particular? Okay. Well, before us, we have we have two different funding sources. We have the funding sources for six clinicians from the city of Houston, and we have funding sources for six clinicians for commissioner's court. And so when we post positions, of course, that's that actually helped make us 24-7. Even with six clinicians, we were actually still able to be 24-7 just by scattering the shifts around. And for overnight shifts, yes, they have their they have a salary, but they also have a stipend. They have a shift differential stipend. So day shift, there there is no shift differential. Evening shift, there's actually a five thousand dollar shift differential, and overnight there's a six thousand dollar shift differential. So if you, and, and, and to be honest, there's a shift. We found out that there's literally a shift for everyone. For example, we have shifts that cover the whole weekend. I mean, you don't get a weekend off. 
But those shifts are pretty much for people who, for instance, have kids. And that way they don't have to pay for daycare. Then we have people who, to be honest, they're working another full-time job during the day. So of course they, they are. And they have cord where they can you know, stay up all night and monitor the iPad. So there's a shift for everyone. And th these are people who have been in these shifts since the pilot. I mean, they've gotten to these shifts. I mean, there, there's pretty much no turnover unless you have somebody retiring, but they've gotten into these shifts and they, they work these shifts and they, they, they stay because it works for them. Got it, got it. That's really helpful to hear. <clears throat> okay, folks, we have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, oh, Jessica, I got a question in the chat. Let's see here. So do you have this pay structure that you'd be willing to share? Um, and Jessica is right in the middle of these conversations while recruiting. So I think she would be very grateful to see some of that. Uh, Keisha, is that something you're able to share externally? Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll, we'll, I'll share that with her. Wonderful, excellent. And Jessica, while we're on the subject, are there any other questions you have related to hiring or maintaining staff on the mental health side? No, that was the main thing. We're in the process of trying to figure out pay structures, having a really hard time recruiting for evenings, um, but agree once you find someone that likes that, uh, it can fit really well. Um, but also know that we could probably incentivize it better as well, because we don't have any um, incentive uh, incentives currently. So it was just helpful to, to hear that, those numbers that you had. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. Casey has a question. All right. Uh, have you utilized telehealth or tablets? <clears throat> oh, this is a great question. So are, is CORE active inside of correctional facilities at all? Um, are you utilizing the tablets inside the jail for assessments or referrals at all? Yes. So one of our police agency actually uh, went to that uh, that we that we collaborate with when we expanded the program to their police agency, not only for patrol, but they had a, they operate a small jail uh, kind of like, you know, for uh, municipal issues and things like that. Or before they transport to our jail, um, they do have an, a tablet there for them. At our jail during COVID, we were utilizing them but because we created the diversion desk. We have a, a live clinician there that does the assessment, but we, the short answer is yes. Excellent. Casey, any follow-up on that? Um, just if any kind of uh, references you can send us, we're actually looking at it for, um, we're felony probation and parole and some of our um, mental health services we can um, divert them to rather than them going back before the judge require a mental health assessment. And we're struggling to get those done since they are in jail. So we're looking at this as an option to get those assessments done. Rico, any thoughts on that? Yeah. So if you could send us a contact, I think uh, Sean McElroy might be a, a good resource for her to reach out to. If uh, I could get her email, I'll, I'll be able to connect her to Sean McElroy. Uh, just looking at what she, that's more specific, I think different from what core is, but I think Sean might be able to help with that. Yeah, absolutely. And for everybody um, here right now, I just put uh, a link in the chat for the Harris County Sheriff's uh, learning site page. At the bottom of that page is contact information for Keisha, for Jose, and for Sean McElroy, who he's talking about. So like I said, these are learning sites, so they are used to people asking questions. If you want to email Sean directly, you're more than welcome. Um, but it looks like uh, Sergeant Gomez took your name down, Casey. So hopefully there's going to be a follow up there. Okay, so we have uh we've budgeted for five more minutes, folks. Are there any questions I may have missed? Anything related to telehealth, to 
and feel free to get specific with your project if there's a question that you need to ask about something you're working on. Um, we have time for a couple more. Real quick, Ethan, I, I was going to mention about equipment. Um, which iPads did we decide to go with? We decided to go with the normal size iPads. Uh, not that the one that's too big, not the one that's too small. I uh, forget exactly what the size is, but the normal one. We did uh, try the mini iPad. Uh, we in policing liked it because it's a smaller weapon that can be utilized against us because I have a five-year-old and, he, and he's hit me with the tablet. It hurts So because they have the OtterBox on them. So we did experiment with that. We liked it, but there's also... Uh, other capabilities of the the normal size iPads that the Harris Center can utilize if we you know have to recycle them things of that nature, and it's worked out great. So no complaints. Even you know even we though we tried the mini one, there's no complaints with the normal size one. We do suggest uh, for police officers or you know and, and not for us is it is a directive to have backup when you're going to do the assessment because if you're holding the tablet as a police officer, your hands are busy. If you give the tablet to the individual, now they have something they can hit you with. So you definitely need somebody else there while that assessment is going on, because as the primary officer doing the assessment, you have the ear on, on what's going on and you're trying to make sure that you're trying to process all that information. Your backup officer should you know, watch out for you. So we do we do uh, tell them to have backup when they're going to deploy the core program. Got it. Okay. Well, I don't see any more questions in the chat. And so I'm just going to let everyone know um, if you have not taken a look through the chat, I do encourage you to. There's a number of useful links in there, a link to the Harris Center's page on their crisis services, a link to HCSO's page about their CIT division and all of their mental health collaborations links to the learning site webpage where you can learn more about these programs, the implementation guide for the core program and their work with Arnold Ventures. I would highly recommend taking a look at that. I've read it. It's very interesting to see how this whole collaboration began and a lot of the information that they gathered initially. Um, and if anybody uh, would like to share this with anyone, we are recording today's session. All of our sessions are recorded. You can find them on the CSG Justice Center YouTube channel. Again, I put that link in the chat for you all. And of course, if you have any questions for myself uh, or our presenters today, you can reach out directly to myself or them with questions. Um, I am organizing the Ask the Expert series for this year. We have three more sessions. And so if you've got questions, if you need registration links, whatever it may be, feel free to reach out. Uh, always happy to speak with you all. And as I mentioned, uh, Rico and Keisha are both learning site representatives. So they're very used to fielding questions from folks like yourselves who are looking to learn about the programs that they have in place. So with that, I'm going to close out our meeting. I want to thank you all so much for being here today. I really appreciate great questions. And of course, a huge thank you to our two presenters. Really appreciate your time and the um, information that you're sharing with everyone today. I know I learned a lot and I've spoken with you a bunch of times before. So I assume that everyone else uh, really took some, some valuable uh, information away from this meeting. So Thank you all once again. Uh, hope you have a wonderful day. And if you have any follow-up questions, you know where to find us. Take care, folks.